New scientific discoveries are being made every year. It would probably be pretty weird if they weren't. Of course, many of these discoveries are rather boring. For example, in 2023, there were 619 new species of wasps identified. Woo! And that's not terribly exciting, both because there are already well over 100,000 different known species of wasps and because wasps f***ing suck. But sometimes these new discoveries are much more surprising, from Cretaceous blood vessels to black hole photographs. Today, we're going to look at five of the most surprising scientific discoveries of the last 20 years. When an animal dies, its soft tissue breaks down and decomposes over time. If the conditions are just right, hard tissue, like bones, can gradually acquire minerals from the surrounding environment to become fossils. Even in the case of mummified remains, the soft tissue would no longer be soft. Instead, the mummification process causes the soft tissue to be replaced by minerals faster than it can decompose. This was the conventional wisdom for as long as anybody could remember, but it was all upended by a shocking discovery. In 2000, Bob Harmon a paleontologist at the Museum of the Rockies discovered a Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton in the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. It took a full two years to excavate the skeleton, which was then wrapped and plastered, ready for shipping. However, despite being relatively small by T-Rex standards, the plaster-wrapped skeleton was too heavy for the helicopter to carry away. The researchers had to split the fossilized remains into two groups to be shipped separately, but one of the femur bones was broken in the process. Fragments from the broken bone were sent to Dr. Mary Schweitzer at North Carolina State University. It was there that Schweitzer would make an incredible discovery, because she did something that no paleontologist in their right mind would have ever done before. She dissolved the fragments in acid. This was a seemingly bizarre decision to make, because if the whole sample was made entirely of rock, as would have been expected from a 68 million year old dinosaur fossil, then the entire sample would have dissolved. But that ain't what happened. Instead, the weak acid demineralized the sample, revealing the presence of soft tissue, including blood vessels. Schweitzer repeated this process with other samples and found similar results. The 2007 analysis discovered collagen and further examination was able to identify amino acid chains present in the T-Rex's soft tissue. Three of the chains found were similar to chickens, with the other two being similar to newts and frogs. Schweitzer also identified the presence of a medullary bone in the femur, a special type of bone that grows in female birds as a calcium reservoir that they can draw from while creating creating eggs. This meant that the T-Rex, named Bob after its initial discoverer, was female and preparing to lay eggs. Inside the blood vessels, Schweitzer identified a large number of small round microstructures. These are almost certainly red blood cells, though Schweitzer and her team chose not to declare them as such out of an abundance of caution. But of course, this raises an obvious question, and one that has continually annoyed the researchers. If dinosaur soft tissue complete with red blood cells has been found, does that mean there is DNA that can be used to make Jurassic Park a reality? Well, maybe, but also probably not. Though Schweitzer said she found chemicals consistent with being DNA, she could not prove that it actually was. More importantly, DNA is an extremely fragile molecule. Any samples found would likely only be tiny fragments, and they are very easily contaminated. To find enough usable samples of DNA that were definitely not the result of contamination and that could be sequenced together to provide meaningful information should be all but an impossibility. But then again, soft tissue surviving for 68 million years was also thought to be all but an impossibility until Dr. Schweitzer's discovery, so who can really say for sure? It was a discovery that scientists had been waiting for for 50 years, and had been nearly 15 years in the making. The standard model of particle physics had gained acceptance in the 1970s, but there was still one particle missing. In 1964, British physicist Peter Higgs proposed the existence of a special particle that was responsible for giving all other particles their mass. This particle was one of five elementary bosons, and it was named the Higgs boson after the famous physicist. The Higgs boson was a crucial part of the standard model and its 61 elementary particles. But as the years went on, only 60 of these particles had been confirmed to exist. The Higgs boson remained elusive, particularly because they were so difficult for scientists to produce. The particle had 133 times the mass of a hydrogen atom, which was a huge hurdle. In the famous equation e equals mc squared, the m represents mass. Since the particle was so heavy, a reaction that would produce one would require a massive amount of energy. The other issue was how 
how unstable the particle was. A Higgs boson's lifespan before decaying is less than two ten thousandths of a billionth of a billionth of a second. Even if one was produced, there was no guarantee it would be detected. But in 1998, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN, along with over 10,000 scientists and hundreds of universities and laboratories across over 100 countries, joined forces to build the Large Hadron Collider. The project took 10 years to construct, and it was finally turned on for its first run in 2010, after over a year of initial delays and complications. Though some segment of the population was terrified that turning on the LHC was going to create a black hole that would destroy the entire planet in an instant, scientists were excited that this machine might finally have the power to create a Higgs boson. And in 2012, they announced that it did. This was a massive discovery, and the final puzzle piece required to complete the standard model of particle physics. Or at least this is what was believed the discovery would do. However, as effective as the standard model was at making predictions, more recent experimentation has started producing results that deviate from those predictions. This means that the standard model is likely not as complete as was once believed, but the discovery of the Higgs boson still provides evidence that this particle and the resulting Higgs field is responsible for giving all particles in the universe their mass. Without the Higgs boson, matter as we know it simply would not exist. So even if there are more discoveries waiting to be made in particle physics, the importance of this particle cannot possibly be overstated. The idea of converting all types of blood to type O is hardly a new concept. Blood type is determined by the presence of antigens on the surface of red blood cells. Cells with antigen A are type A blood, and those with antigen B are type B blood, and those with both are type AB. Blood that is neither is type O, and this is the most valuable for blood transfusions. A person's blood plasma is full of antibodies that will attack any foreign substance, and that includes the antigens found on blood cells. If a person receives blood containing an antigen not normally present in their blood, the antibodies can react with the blood cells and cause them to clump together. This is known as agglutination, and it is a life-threatening condition. However, while a person can't receive blood that has antigens not normally found in their body, there's nothing wrong with receiving blood that doesn't have the antigens that their body normally produces. The blood types don't need to be an exact match, there just can't be anything included that wasn't in the patient to begin with. This is what makes type O blood quite so valuable, as it can be given to any patient without fear of an autoimmune reaction. Experiments to strip blood cells of their antigens, effectively turning all donor blood into type O, began back in the 1980s. There was some amount of success using enzymes to strip the antigens, but nothing that could be considered practical. The process was slow, it required large amounts of enzymes, and it only worked when performed at specific temperatures. Despite the lackluster research, results into this possible breakthrough never stopped. In 2007, a new enzyme was discovered that showed dramatic results. It was a huge step forward, and things have continued to advance since then. The most recent study was published on April 29, 2024, by Matthias Jensen et al., and it has the most promising results thus far. The conversion took only 30 minutes, was possible at room temperature, and required small amounts of enzymes, roughly 18 mg for 200 ml of type A blood and 8 mg for type B blood. It was the specific enzymes that facilitated these drastically improved results which caused the biggest surprise, because the answer was inside us all along. Acomancia mucinophilia is a type of bacteria found in the human gut that breaks down large sugar molecules. It was enzymes from these bacteria that proved most efficient at stripping blood cells of their antigens. It is hoped that this process will help alleviate some of the blood shortages facing hospitals, as there would no longer be a need to match patient and donor blood types. But we're not quite there yet. As promising as all of the results have been, at the time of writing, there do not seem to be any patients that have received this treated blood yet. It still needs to be tested and approved by regulatory bodies before there is any chance of it seeing widespread use. But the fact that all blood can be converted to type O quickly and efficiently using enzymes from our gut microbiome is an incredible discovery. For adults in the United States, the leading causes of death are heart disease and cancer. But for infants, the leading cause of death and morbidity is premature birth. Babies born prematurely are typically put on ventilators to help them breathe, especially in the case of extremely premature birth. Though these machines are effective, they are not without their limitations and risks. One of the main risk factors for premature babies is that their lungs are often not fully developed. This can make attempting to breathe air difficult, and even if the ventilator helps them survive, there is a risk that their lungs will still have difficulty fully developing. 
Instead, researchers sought to create a type of artificial womb that would allow babies to continue developing as normal. The earliest patent for an artificial womb was filed in 1954, though nothing came of this original patent. More serious attempts began in the 1990s, when technology had progressed significantly, and in 1996, Japan's Nintendo University developed an artificial womb that successfully incubated a goat fetus for three weeks. However, there were several problems with their system, and it never progressed to a point where it could be considered for human testing. For decades, there were no major developments. But in 2017, researchers out of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia published a paper in the journal Nature about their new artificial womb referred to as the Biobag. The bag was a clear, sterile bag filled with amniotic fluid that the fetuses could breathe. The bags were carefully temperature controlled and an umbilical cord was connected to the machines that exchanged oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as providing nutrients and growth factors. This would allow the fetus to develop as normal the way it would in utero. The whole system was kept in a dark room with speakers simulating the sound of the mother's heartbeat. In total, eight lamb fetuses spent time in the biobag as part of the initial research. The lambs were at an equivalent developmental stage to an extremely premature human baby, and they were kept in the biobags for up to 28 days each. The lambs continued to develop normally while in the biobags, and the 28-day limit was only due to restrictions on animal testing rather than technological constraints. Other teams around the world had been trying to create artificial wombs, but the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia seemed to have progressed far beyond what anyone else had thus far accomplished. Though they remained hopeful that their technology would be approved for human trials and have tremendous faith in its viability, there are still limitations. The idea that the biobag could replace a full pregnancy and thus eliminate the need for surrogacy was deemed a pipe dream at this point, and the team does not appear to have any intentions of creating a machine that would be capable of doing so. Ever since Albert Einstein predicted the existence of black holes in his theory of general relativity, they have fascinated scientists and laypeople alike. This only became more true 50 years later in 1964, when the first evidence of a black hole was detected. Black holes have always been detected and observed using things like gravitational lensing or the movement of stellar bodies, but there was never a direct image of one. And that kind of makes sense. After all, black holes produce gravity so strong that not even light can escape them, so by their very definition, they should be invisible. Some do have accretion disks, which would produce visible light, but this is not always the case. Even when it is, their small size and incredible distance from Earth make direct imaging of accretion disks almost impossible in most cases. As such, the idea of ever having a direct image of a black hole seemed like an impossibility. But that all changed in 2017 when the first ever photo of a black hole was taken, though it is not a photo in the traditional sense. The image was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope, EHT, which is a global network of radio telescopes operated by hundreds of researchers across dozens of countries. By taking measurements from all over the world, their goal was to essentially turn the entire planet into a giant telescope aimed directly at the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, Messier 87. Radio telescopes were used both because we already know that the gases surrounding black holes emit large amounts of X-rays and radio waves, and because there's nothing else there that would be guaranteed to show up in the visible spectrum. While nothing can escape the event horizon of a black hole, the radio telescopes were able to detect the massive, irregularly shaped ring of glowing gas surrounding the black hole. In total, the HT collected about 5 1,500 terabytes of data that had to be carefully analyzed by multiple independent groups to make sure that the images produced were accurate. It took 10 years of work and planning to set up the EHD, and once the image was taken, it took another two years before they were finally released to the public in April of 2019. The original image looked like an orange fuzzy donut, though a few years later a sharper image was created, allowing machine learning algorithms to further analyze the data. Seeing a direct image of a black hole may seem like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but multiple more images have been released since then. These include an image of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, and an image of a black hole expelling a powerful jet of matter. Even if the images represent X-rays and radio waves that aren't in the visible spectrum of light, there were few scientific discoveries more surprising to the general public than a direct photograph of a black hole. 